sanctuary, we really appreciate your presence. We know that you're here by divine appointment, and we'll be bringing something special and wonderful to us, and we know that you'll take away something special and wonderful and enriching for your life from this service. I especially want to thank any ushers and greeters from the welcoming ministry who are just so great, so dedicated to help us get seated and, and stay safe six feet apart. If you're on that team, would you raise your hand and everybody give them a round of applause. Um, also want to thank uh, Patricia Reese, our videographer today, and our sound technician, Jeremiah Bircher. So, thank you guys. And please, let's do, take every precaution we can to stay six feet apart and uh, wear your mask over your mouth and nose at all times, unless you have a medical reason not to. And when the service is over, if you would stay seated, wait for an usher to excuse you, and then go straight to your car. So, a um, few, brief, few brief announcements today. The wholehearted living book discussion that was going to be on Zoom has been canceled. We had only a couple of people signed up, so we're going to save that for another day. All right, the thing you've all been waiting for. Next Sunday, after service, will be our annual meeting. Whoa, whoa. Woo! So, uh, normally we have these the end of April, but because of the pandemic, we've had to wait until it was safe to have people back in the building, at the, you know, with high numbers. So, with the annual meeting, everyone's welcome to attend, but if we have anything to vote for, only active members are allowed to vote. So, that's how that goes. And if you would like to feel, if you come here but feel safer, we will have downstairs wired up for sound. Are we going to have video as well? We're going to have video as well if you prefer to sit downstairs and watch it. Uh, or if you'd like to stay at home and do it via Zoom, then please call our church office and uh, Sarah will get you lined up to watch it on Zoom. All right, so uh, now I will introduce our, our chaplain for today, for the Daily Word, Mary Tuminello. Knowing that all things are possible, 
no matter what is going on in our lives, we know there is only one God and one present at work in our life. And we hold steadfast to that thought. We hold on to it and we move forward and we know all things are possible. We are so grateful for this because with it, we know there is perfection. Hold fast, steadfast, and so it is. Amen. Good morning. I had a conversation the other day with a friend who asked a question that we hear so often. His young daughter had been diagnosed with COVID, and in a matter of days, three other family members came down with it. This person in his question asked, why doesn't God do something about this pandemic? Well, how often do people ask one of these questions in times of difficulty? Why doesn't God heal this condition? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Why doesn't God make people just get along with each other? We're going to examine these questions today as we continue Reverend Jan's series on change and transition based on two books, Finding Yourself in Transition by Reverend Robert Grummond and Hell in the Hallway, Light at the Door by Reverend Ellen Devonport. Reverend Jan has been talking about the hallway where we end up when one way of life ends and we're waiting for the mystery of a new way of life to unfold. This is a period of intense uncertainty where life as we know it has ended. But what comes next is still a mystery. Transition is a process. It doesn't happen overnight and it can be a period of growth and understanding. It's often characterized by intense pain and longing for what was. And the question eventually arises, why me? Why now? Why this? Ellen Devonport tells us some hallways are predictable. An elderly parent has been failing for years. A marriage has been in trouble for a long time. An illness or addiction has grown worse. You knew your company was downsizing. Other hallways are sudden or unexpected. You're thrust into them by events like we're experiencing right now with the pandemic. Even in the midst of change you chose for yourself, such as starting a new career or moving across the country, you might wonder what you were thinking when you deliberately closed a door and chose to step into the hallway. Any hallway can feel like hell at times, no matter the circumstances that put you there. And at those times, you're likely to ask some version of why me, why this? Which brings us to the most difficult, 
but also the most empowering lesson of the hallway. You chose it. It's not happening to you. It's happening for you. Reverend Devonport explains the difficulty, the challenge of this lesson. She says, many people acknowledge that their thoughts and attitudes influence the events of their lives until something bad happens. Then they disown any role in it. They claim they can only play the hand like dealt them. She goes on to ask us to please consider this next idea slowly and carefully. Here we go. Each of us chooses every hallway we enter every time. Let's pause and take a breath. No matter how much we might appear to be innocent victims or want to believe we had nothing to do that, with the circumstances that seem forced upon us, these experiences have a purpose. Many purposes, many gifts. Somehow, hallways are necessary to our life paths, and we draw these experiences to us. As we're learning every day of this pandemic, the hallways also seem to be brought on by others' crises. Besides my friend, whose family was infected with the COVID virus, just this week, a very dear friend of mine lost her husband unexpectedly. I know a woman trying to find her purpose after being laid off from her job, and I have a close friend who just lost his mom and dad three weeks apart. So take a moment and think of the people you know struggling with a personal crisis. As our mission statement says here at First Unity Church, one of the ways we enrich lives is through service. There are so many of us in this spiritual community that look for ways to support someone in a hallway in their life. You didn't create their circumstances, but if you choose to be involved, then it's bringing gifts and growth for you as well. Somehow, events work together for the highest good of all, even with each of us creating our individual experiences. For example, I learned a great deal and received beautiful gifts eventually from a series of events that happening individually would be considered pretty life-changing. But these events happened for me in a very short time frame of one month. On the same day that my husband passed away in 2015, the company I worked for announced its merger with a bigger company. Two weeks later, Reverend Randy Schmele, our longtime and well-loved minister, retired. And two weeks after that event, the group I had managed for several years at my full-time job was disbanded by the new company. And I had no idea yet what was next for me at my job. Reflecting on that time, I was truly wandering in the wilderness of the unknown. It surprised me most days that the sun came up. But this was the surest sign I needed to show me that my sole agreement was to participate in all the feelings, thoughts, and decisions that came up in each new day, carrying on with my life and learn what was mine to learn from these experiences. 
There's a story in the Bible about a whole nation of people in a hallway. We find this story in the book of Exodus. Can you guess what the story is? It's the story of Moses and the children of Israel. They narrowly escaped Pharaoh's grasp, only to find themselves in the desert without food or water. They had no idea where they were going, and they were virtually defenseless against any hostile force they might encounter. It seems to me if anyone had a right to cry, why does God let bad things happen to good people? They did. Furthermore, having lived many generations under the rule of the Egyptians, they were totally unfamiliar and unprepared for the nomadic life of the desert. They were far outside their comfort zone. Yet being in this hallway for the Israelites was not a mistake. They were not victims. They chose to be where they found themselves. And we play a role in creating our hallways as well. In her book, Ellen Davenport says, Ancient wisdom tells us we are the creators of our experience and that our thoughts attract people, events, and ideas as we need them. This spiritual law has been taught by the masters for thousands of years. The Hebrew Bible says, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. Jesus said, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And the Buddha said 2,500 years ago, all that we are is the result of what we have thought. In this ancient wisdom, we find another soul lesson. They weren't saying we are to blame for whatever happens in our lives, or that we wanted specific events to occur. They were saying we have more creative power than we've imagined, as well as the responsibility to use it as consciously as possible. The advantage of seeing yourself as a creator is that it allows you to find meaning in an unexpected or unpleasant experience. I believe as the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, they continuously looked for meaning in their unpleasant experience. This is why no matter how much they grumbled or murmured, as the Bible describes it, or felt victimized, they kept turning to Moses for guidance and the purpose in their journey. They believed in Moses because he had direct access to the Lord of our being, the I am within each of us, our personal well of creative power. Often we find in this life that this connection is the only thing that saves us. If we listen to the voice of this divine essence, the still, small voice of our intuition, and follow the guidance we receive, we become free of the many maladies that plague us. The concepts of blame and victim result from having judged an event to be bad or wrong, unfair and undeserved, a senseless tragedy. But instead of asking, why me? What if we shift the question? Asking why me, or refusing to consider that good might come from pain, leaves you in a state of victimhood. It leads to thinking God is fickle, unfair, and bad things happen to good people. Believing things happen to you gives you endless justification for bitterness, anger, 
and pain, with no responsibility to do anything for yourself. But what if somehow it happened for you? If you shift your consciousness to consider, even consider that you chose this experience consciously or more often unconsciously, then the divine part of you is offering an opportunity for inner work and insight. The I am essence within is our healer. It is this power that brings us to wholeness. Think of this inner work as going back to school before starting a new career, challenging and often not optional. We may even need to take more than one run at it. So let's return to the story of Exodus for an example of this. Do you remember in the Exodus story that Moses had to get the Ten Commandments a second time because he threw down the first set in a fit of rage when he found the Israelites in the midst of a wild party and worshiping a golden calf? He melted down the golden calf and when it cooled, the gold was ground into dust mixed with water and he forced the people to drink it. Well, after the people repented, the Lord again wrote the Ten Commandments in tablets of stone. The people then constructed the Holy Tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant according to the direction dictated to Moses. Reverend Robert Brummett, in his book, Finding Yourself in Transition, describes another soul lesson. He says, one might say that this was Israel's experience of initiation. Like most initiations, it wasn't easy. The Israelites experienced doubt, fear, confusion, regression, and finally, repentance. I wonder if we could ask them today if they would wish that difficult experience on anyone else, or if they would trade the learning and growth they received from it for something else. I know in my own life, experiences in the hallways, I would trade them for anything. How about you? Whatever regressions or setbacks we may seem to be, to be experiencing, it's very important to keep doing the inner work and to have faith. What appears to be regression is a normal part of the evolutionary process. Eventually, we will regain our conscious connection to the I am essence within and we will be guided every step along the way. Some people believe that each of us comes to Earth with a broad outline of lessons we want for our soul's growth. Reverend Devonport suggests we think of this like a vacation adventure with zip lines and rock climbing. Challenging, sometimes scary, but exhilarating and worthwhile. We go home with an expanded view of ourselves, pleased with our courage and accomplishments, or at least great stories to tell. Such is our time on earth as spiritual beings having a human experience. How our soul lessons will be achieved through human events may or may, or may not be worked out before we're born. Nonetheless, we still draw experiences to us. We are likely to label these experiences bad, wrong, unfair, painful, or even hellish when we encounter them. This doesn't make them any less useful. The work of the hallway is to shift our thinking 
from victim to volunteer. Why did this happen to me? To why did this happen for me? And why did it? As Reverend Ellen explains, because this hallway is the quickest, most direct route to what you really want. Maybe you want changes in your human life, or you want lessons for your soul. Whatever you're going through is fulfilling your deepest desires for growth and learning. Most of us in the hallway had no idea we were choosing a major life change or agreeing to participate in someone else's. Nearly everyone wants to know why on earth he or she would have chosen this circumstance and what possible sole purpose it could be supporting. We might not receive a definitive answer in this lifetime, but even without that, we still garner gifts and wisdom. We still find meaning for our life that we couldn't have received any other way. And here's one more soul lesson. Please don't think that you have to experience pain in order to grow. We can learn through joy as well. We draw to us what we need for our soul's growth in the best way available at the time. We attract the conditions necessary to satisfy our deepest intentions. And we don't always know consciously what those intentions are. We've all walked through hallways where we opened unexpected new doors and eventually walked out into bright sunshine. The disbanding of a project that might do a much better job, a child getting married, the birth of a child or grandchild, it all happens for you. There's one more piece of ancient wisdom that I'll close with today. In it, we're encouraged to rely on our spiritual maturity to realize that our lives are always preparing us for our best and highest good. You can find this piece of wisdom in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. And so it is. And my heart is overflowing.
I invite you to get comfortable in your seat and close your outer eyes if you'd like. Sit tall and place both feet on the floor. Get relaxed, but remain alert, bringing your attention to the breath. Take a few moments to become present to the body, to become present to breathing, to become present to this very moment. And now, I invite you to review the past few days of your life and see if you can identify some person or event or some circumstance that has been your teacher in some way. See if you can see some experience from which you may have learned something. Once you have focused in on the particular situation or the event, just be present to what you're feeling in the body and see if you can identify what you may have learned in this experience. Be open to the question, why did this happen? for me. Don't try to think too much about it or overanalyze it. Just be present to your thoughts, feelings, sensations in the body. Just be present to what's here as you sit with this question this inquiry. Begin to realize the one power and one presence around you enfolding you with comfort and peace. Feel the inner knowing arise that through this experience or event you are growing and learning. You begin to understand and are at peace with it. Quietly consider that this experience could be happening for you, an experience born of divine love. You do not lack anything. You are not limited by anything. You are simply doing the inner work that is needed to unfold your greater good and find meaning for your life. Let yourself feel and embrace the infinite potential of your soul the I am essence within you, your personal well of creative power. As we prepare to enter the silence, listen to the voice of this divine essence, the still, small voice of our intuition, and follow the guidance you receive. Do this now for a few moments in the silence.
now we come together, whether you are here in this sanctuary or whether you're in the comfort of your own home, whether you're a first-time guest, a long-time member, we all together are the First Unity Church of St. Louis. We are all one, living each day in joyful anticipation of unfolding our greater good in our lives and in the world. We support one another and we are so grateful. And we say in the name and in the power of the Christ. Amen. And so it is. And so we joyously allow it to be. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. And we will end today's service with an original arrangement by Joe Nesky on piano. The song is Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. 
And after that, if you would just stay seated until the ushers dismiss you. All right. Thank you, Joe.